I'm Tony Whitfield. I work for SANS. Um, I work for the On Demand team. So, as much as I love and endorse taking the live classes, um, whenever you attend events like this, On Demand classes are awesome. You get four months to take the class to do all the exercises and everything else. Wonderful. Um, highly recommended. And, you know, even Rob thinks it's a good idea too, so go ahead. So, the last few times I've presented at the summit, it's been a bit of a mixed bag, okay? Some of it is really technical, some of it's not really technical, and this falls into like that latter category. So, we're not going to go and dive into really deep technical details around things here, but um, I think this is still going to be pretty valuable to a lot of people. Um, why would you do evidence generation? Well, a lot of the stuff that we do on, on a daily basis is based on some kind of evidence generation. So, like for example, all you saw um, Heather and Sarah this morning talking about the evidence generation, which they quite reasonably uh, generate for your husbands through fields and everything. They know what they did, so they're able to correlate that data back. They can tell you when things happened because they were there at the time. So the tools which they use to do these kinds of things, do these investigations, and the procedures and, the, and everything else they develop as a result, can be um, more effective as a result because they were there. Same goal when you want to generate any kind of test evidence. So, some of you may think, well, yeah, you know what? Um, it's not that big of a deal. Um, I'll let other people handle that. But what I can tell you is that at some point um, throughout your career, you're going to encounter that one forensic artifact. Some random Chinese social media application or, or something else. You have to then pass out, get the data from figure it out. Now, that can be really difficult if you're just taking data straight off a piece of evidence, because you have no background on that whatsoever. You have some indication of what it's doing, but unless you get down into the weeds yourself, generate the test evidence yourself with all the notes that are going to go along with it, eh, you may not get as good results as, you, as you're hoping for. And you can guess, which always will be really well in this field, um, no. Test, testing your evidence, uh, generating test evidence for your test your forensic tools is always going to be a good idea. So, I have to go, why would you do test evidence? Well, you can uh, validate the existing tools, you can then move into tool development if you find something which is a bit more niche. Um, you can use it for testing new hires. You can then use it also for testing current stat, maybe sure up the on things. And then you add in the educational components too. Um, so let's take a look at the first two. They kind of tied together. And there's various different, various different reasons that you might want to do this for existing tool validation. Now, the first one is that if any of you have ever done any kind of lab accreditation or <coughs> ISO work, anyone here done that before? I don't see any hands, but you're all very lucky then. Um, I, I did the ISO 17025 documentation for a company I used to work for back in the UK, and it is a nightmare. Okay? Anytime you get um, a new tool release, you have to use your golden image to then go and verify everything that happens there. Um, make sure that all the data outputs from the forensic tool are accurate. If they're not accurate, you have to note that and make it by the clause of every report you generate. Now, obviously, lab accreditation and ISO work is not the only time when you want to validate your tools. Um, if anyone remembers the social experiment by Harlan Carvey, um, yeah, I see people nodding their heads. Um, that's one very, very good reason you want to validate your tools. Um, it also depends a lot on you want to do this, whether you want to do it by being looking at, do you want to test a full forensic image, 
do we want to test just a subset of that data? For example, I mean, if, if you were to analyze like the registry keys or, or specific registry key, you don't want you don't want or need a full thread to get, right? You can just focus on something smaller. And generating that kind of evidence is really straightforward and easy. All you do is to type some stuff in, maybe browse a few websites, do some activity on the computer, and boom, you've got your uh, your registry. There may be other things too. Very specific artifacts you want to focus on. In that case, you generate those specific artifacts only, you feed them into whatever tools, whatever analysis you need to, and then you can validate the tool that way. The next thing is the testing of new hires and potentially your existing stack too. Now, I've had a couple of job interviews in the last few years where I was actually given forensic evidence to test. And I had to analyze that data, produce a report, and then my capacity as a future employee was evaluated based on what I found. Now, there's a few different reasons for this. Okay? Now, yes, you want someone to be able to use the tools which you're going to use every day, but that's not really the most important reason for this. The most important reason is that you want to have someone who will critically look at the ways to do things, who have developed knowledge and procedures themselves that will help them to get to, to the underlying evidence. Yes, it's great for them to be able to sit there and push buttons on, them, on a piece of software and for everything to be done automatically, but you, know, you don't need to hire um, people like that. And you could have like, the, the cleaner come in and do that at night when you're at home. It's just you need. You want someone who's critically thinking the whole process. And then finally, we have the educational component. So, how many of you people here today are going to stick around after the summit is over and take one of the forensics classes on? Okay, There's not enough of you, by the way. That's not enough. Um, if, if you choose to take one of these classes, almost every single one of the forensics classes on here will walk you through specific uh, evidence scenarios that the authors and the instructors have created for themselves. Okay? Further, you'll get to like the day six challenge, and the instructors again have created those scenarios for you. And we heard Heather and Sarah again say today that they have brand new scenarios that they've created. And the amount of work which goes into these is, is phenomenal. Okay? Um, I know from talking to Sarah that she's been basically traversing the globe with a backpack full of Mac systems in order to generate all this data. Um, it takes a long time, and we'll get into that in a little bit, just a minute. But basically, for these, all you want to know is whether or not people can actually find what you want. Oh, also, just quickly, let's not forget Net Wars too. If you participate in VFIR on Net Wars this week, um, again, evidence data which has been generated by the instructors for you to participate in that. So all, all these things go towards, you know, this is why evidence uh, generation is important. So <clears throat> about a year ago, um, Rob asked me to help him to generate a new forensics challenge for Forensics 500. And we've called it the Stack Challenge because it's the name of the person involved. So this one was pretty interesting. So um, I'd never done anything like this before. And Rob gave me some guidelines and instruction on how to make this work. And it was, it was pretty, pretty fun and interesting. And I, I learned a lot of stuff along the way. So. I had to come up with my own set of guidelines, though. So first, obviously, you need a plan. Uh, you can't just kind of think, well, we'll do a bit of this, a bit of that, and maybe at the end of the day, we'll have something which, which students in Forensics 500 will, will enjoy doing. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't work that way. So I had to come up with this plan. And so I sat down with my family, actually, 
and came up with this scenario, um, which, and, and if, you're, if you're taking Forensics 500 this week and you're sitting there taking notes really quickly, like, yes, this is gonna help me on the challenge. No, it's not gonna help you on the challenge. This is all from a very high level, I'm sorry. Um, take notes anyway. Um, but yeah, we sat down together, made this plan, and we, we tried to figure out what exactly we were gonna need. Then we evaluated that plan, and we tried to find out where the good and bad spots were and all that. We implemented it, and then we conducted what I call the post-mortem. That might look bad, it's just my own way of saying uh, post-evaluation. So the planning phase, first thing we needed to do was that Rob said we wanted to get all of these artifacts. And as much as is covered in the material, we need to try and generate. And that could be pretty difficult. We'll get on to why in just a minute. Um, but what we needed to do in order to generate all these artifacts in, in the appropriate amount of time was that I wrote a script. Now, I'm not talking about like a Python script. I'm talking actually like a physical here's a bound movie or TV script where we outlined this is what was gonna happen on this particular date, this is why it was gonna happen, this is where it lines up with the whole uh, storyline and so on and so forth. And, the, and we all agreed that we were gonna stick as rigidly to that script as possible. And then once we had that, it had that plan in place, we could then go back and say, well, we can determine what we need in terms of hardware. And that one got to be a little bit interesting, and I'll get onto that again in, in just a minute. But one of the, the main things that I was going for with this was realism, okay? The last thing we want is for people to open up um, a forensic image and it to be like, what the crap is this? This, this, you know, this doesn't look real at all. And I've got a couple of examples here. So the first one is that when I was at university, um, I actually did digital, I was one of the first digital forensic students in the UK. And our, our lecturer, um, for like one of our group projects, provided us with a forensic image and it basically said, go and analyze this, produce a report, and you'll get graded on your report. Now, from what I could tell, <laughs> He generated this over the space of like a week and a half on a VM, on a system somewhere, and it was this really contrived scenario where fishing and anything to do with fish was completely illegal. And so we had to look up anything to do with fishing and produce a report on it. Now, I find it really hard to, to, to suspend my belief in reality, and so uh, I didn't go along with what the assignment was at all. Instead, I went about um, proving that he, gen that he set this person up with all this fake evidence because of him installing VMware tools, it being a VM, lots of other nice little stuff in the registry and everything else. And my final report um, said, said something on the lines of, this is all fake, this, this is a whole bunch of nonsense. And um, the lecturer very begrudgingly gave me a very high mark for that. So, yeah. We, will, we want to try and keep things realistic. Um, another instance that I, I recently became aware of, and I'm sorry, Rob, um, was that for the old scenario in Forensics 500, um, apparently there was a team recently that they dove so far into the data that rather than doing the outlined challenge, they basically presented at the end of the class why Rob Lee had set up this whole um, this whole murder suicide and so yeah um, the, the idea is we don't want that to happen we want students to come in to do these challenges and for it to be yeah this is this could actually be someone's real computer this is something which we want to to investigate and get our teeth into so that was the plan and then we went back and we we evaluated the plan and we made a few changes because some of it, while, while realistic, um, was still bordered on, on the lines of realism. So the f there was a few things we, we wanted to look at first. Uh, can we do what we wanna do? Is it possible? And 
whenever we put this plan together and this script, we, we try to identify certain areas where it was going to be difficult. And we'll get on to one of those reasons why it's difficult very soon. <clears throat> we want to be realistic. We want people to actually see this computer image and be like, wow, this could actually be a real piece of evidence in the case. And then, what could go wrong? And my first thought was, nothing. Nothing can go wrong. And I was wrong. Okay? If you think that nothing will go wrong, you are wrong. So we moved on to the implementation stage, and this is where things really started to go weird. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with that particular um, saying, man plans and God laughs. Yeah, I got a sense of that as I was doing this. So the first thing was this challenge revolves around a single computer. And so I thought, yes, this is going to be easy, a single computer. This is all I'm going to need. Hmm. Well. I was carrying around the equivalent of a small data center. So there yeah, we've, we've moved on from one surface to a surface and a surface book and a MacBook Pro, uh, two iPhones, two Wi-Fi hotspots, a Nook, uh, an Android device, an iPad. So yeah, all these things came in. And there was a few more, but they might give some things away in the challenge, so I'm not going to go into them. But yeah, th this is what was, that was, this was the hardware that we needed. And then, Aside from just the hardware, we also had other things we needed. So because of the nature of this scenario, we needed to be able to use the local high school um, and their Wi-Fi network. Now, apparently, um, the schools don't much like when 40-year-old men hang around outside high schools <laughs> with, with, with cell phones and, and computers. Um, at least that's what the police said when they showed up. So. Um, we needed to kind of rethink that strategy a little bit, and we'll get onto that in just, in just a moment. So we, we wanted to use the, the, school, the high school's network. Another thing is that we needed somewhere for, uh, for this person to live, and that's actually my house, and if you take the challenge, you will have my own physical address. Feel free to stop by um, for a brief visit. Um, and then I had uh, uh, one of my friends, and yes, I do have friends, um, also kindly offered for us to use his house, too, as, as a second part of the scenario. Don't go visit him. He has a big dog and guns, okay? So don't go knocking on his door, hey, I know where you live, because I saw him in the shout. No, don't do that. Um, then we also set up um, Microsoft Online Exchange, and where we were going to mimic the school. So this was interesting. So in order to make things realistic and believable, Every single email that I received from the high school last year, um, I basically copy and pasted, put it into a new email with a different person's name on it, a made-up person, and then sent it. So you'll see, if you do, do the challenge, there's, there's kind of a lot of this realistic stuff going on. We also needed office because, you know, if you go into high school, you get homework and you need to do assignments. Um, and then another interesting piece. Is it realistic if you examine a computer and there's no purchases made? Maybe. But you're going to expect to see things like Netflix or Hulu or you know, Spotify or something like that. Even games, right? And it's not realistic if those things aren't found on, those, on, the, on that computer. So. We use prepaid credit cards, and we go out and we, we purchase these with the subject's name. I'm not sure the entirely of the legality of that, but we'll leave that alone. Um, and, and so we, we, we did like Netflix accounts, and we did other things, we bought other things using these prepaid credit cards to make it look like this was actually realistic. And then finally, um, again, uh, because of the high school issue, I, uh, I couldn't go and do that myself, so I decided I needed a teenage girl to help. Uh, apparently, the police didn't like this idea either. <laughs> but thankfully, I already had one at my disposal. 
um, at my 14-year-old daughter, Kaylee, uh, goes, was starting her freshman year at high school at the same time. It's all very, very convenient. And it, there were some, um, some things I had to give up for this. Uh, I had to empty my wallet, first of all. Uh, and then second of all, um, I promised her that she could accompany me as my guest here. Uh, and so she's, she's here today watching. So, and this whole... And so what's really cool about this um, is that this Microsoft Surface, which is the subject of the investigation in this case, uh, Kaylee, she walked around with that in her high school backpack for like half of the school year. She was connected to the school Wi-Fi. She was doing like surfing web pages, using it for artwork. The only thing that she didn't do, which kind of ticked me off a little bit, is that she didn't do the homework for this, for this person. So I had to do all the homework myself. I don't know what I was paying for, to be fair. So <clears throat> another issue that, that we had is that early on, this was not the stack challenge. Those of you who take SANS classes will know that there's a kind of like a running theme through many of these, and that's the Marvel Universe, right? So originally, um, I thought, well, no one's touched Spider-Man yet, this will be cool. We'll, we'll have Peter Parker, and we'll have um, Gwen, and we'll have MJ, and we'll, we'll do all these people. And so I set up all these Facebook accounts for those people, and um, then I went onto my own Facebook account and said to all my friends, hey, go follow these Facebook accounts that I've created so that I can develop evidence for my scenario. Yeah, well, that didn't work exactly as planned either. So Facebook, around this time, because of the whole election rigging, um, decided that you know, they were going to be cracking down on face, fake book, Facebook accounts. And so I went to log in after a couple of months of generating data just to find it is all gone. So yeah, reevaluated and thought, all right, well, let's change this. Because you know, if you're using comic book characters' names on social media, Facebook probably going to find them pretty quickly, especially if I go and announce the fact that they're fake accounts too probably didn't help. So we finally got the whole thing done. This took about six months in total to do all this. Once again, realism. You don't want to just have a period of two weeks where, gener where data is generated on a computer if you want it to be realistic. It, it just doesn't work that way. So we got to the end. I imaged the computer. Um, and then started to look at what we did and didn't have. And when we compared the plan to the results, th there were some things which, which I thought we generated which weren't properly captured. Now, whether that's because of the type of computer we were using, whether it's due to Windows updates happening, or, or something else, I, I just don't know, or delay, write, something. We, made it so that some of these things just didn't appear. Um, we can get on to what went wrong in a second. Uh, and then after we decided what, we, what went wrong and what we needed to change, um, hopefully uh, Rob will ask me to do this again. So what do we do? What, what happened? Well, time is a huge factor. Okay. Now, I have a full-time job with SANS. Um, I also run my own consultancy company on the side. And then I also have you know, my family and other obligations I've got to deal with. So I would have alarms go off on my phone saying, send this text message now, or send this, do this, send this email. And you know, if you're driving in a car somewhere and that alarm goes off, it's like, oh, uh, crap. No, we'll put that down and we'll deal with that later. So a lot of time, the times were a little bit dicey. Then there was the, uh, <laughs> what we shouldn't have really done at all part of this. And that is, you know, you kind of got this plan in place, you're following this plan, and then suddenly um, Rob was like, oh, have you thought about doing this? I'm like, oh, uh, no. Um, I guess we'll figure out a way to, to, to put that in. Yeah, mm, I, I don't, that wasn't really the best idea either. 
So there were times whenever evidence was kind of force created. Um, we had to change a setting which someone wouldn't typically change inside a Windows system in order to, to force evidence to be generated. So some of that you have to kind of suspend you, your belief in reality just a little bit. <clears throat> this was the major thing for me. Um, like I said before, my home address appears in that, uh, in that whole scenario. Um, but there were a few other things too. Um, and I've since learned this. So part of the issue here is it's just the way the scenario was set up. We had this, this test computer on my home network um, connecting to, to Wi-Fi and whatever else. It could also see other items on my home network. Then when I went to my friend's house, same thing happened over there too. That just, it's not major data leakage. Like you won't find like inappropriate pictures of me or anything like that on there. But um, there are some things in there which might, you might think, huh, I wonder if he meant that to be in there. No, not really. So how do we protect against some of this? Well, when we went back and, and looked and conducted this post-mortem, um, the major thing was network. Like you could see things happening um, because of the way it was set up, my home Wi-Fi ends up getting in there too. So you will see that. The, I, I went and spoke to Phil Hagen about this a little bit. And I asked for his recommendations on things and after sitting in his class and him showing how his home network was set up. I've gone out now and I've invested um, a good chunk of money in, in updating my, my home network. So now, rather than having everything on one particular network, I can say, right, I'm creating a VLAN. And that VLAN will be specifically for testing and evidence generation, all that kind of thing, which is wonderful. Then I can create a Wi-Fi network which is specific to that VLAN. So that should separate all of that stuff out. And it's a great idea, and if, you, if you're serious about testing, you're going to need a setup similar to that. You can't just run it off whatever you want, because I guarantee something you don't want to be on that image will end up on that image. And then we have my Xbox. And this thing really annoyed me. So Rob suggested that we, we use one of those prepaid credit cards and we download a couple of games onto this, onto this surface. Now, the Surface has okay graphics uh, support, but it's not like a gaming system, okay? So we, we bought a couple of games on the Windows Store, and I let my kids play on these games for a little bit, but they got kind of frustrated with it immediately because the graphics weren't good enough, and the game lagged, and it was slow. So I thought, well, here's a good idea. What I'll do is that I'll, I'll put this, this girl's account on my Xbox and then they can play the games on there, because like, they have those cross-platform games now. And when I was reviewing the forensic image of this computer, uh, maybe that wasn't such a good idea, at least not on my own personal Xbox, because now, whenever you look in there, yes, you'll see my uh, login information for Xbox Live. Um, feel free to friend me. Um, I, <laughs> we, we can... We can play games together. Um, but yeah, it was not my intention at all. And so, yeah, all these things contributed to... It. Personally, I think this is a really, really good piece of evidence. There's lots of good stuff in there. There's only... I, I talk about this like it's a big deal. It's not. It's, this is a tiny, tiny piece of the overall thing. It's still a great scenario. And because of the way which we dealt with everything, um, Kaylee walking around with a laptop for six months, um, me generating school emails and, and, and everything else. It, to make this realistic, we generated a lot of background noise for this. Okay? Whenever Rob hands out, handed out this challenge on the first, uh, the first one of this, people actually thought this was a real piece of evidence at, at, at times, just because of the quantity of data on there. 
So I think we actually, we, we made it. I mean, some of it seemed like it was a bit difficult for us to do, but we finally made it over the finish line. Now, like I said, I don't know how many people here are gonna go out and produce full pieces of forensic evidence, like a full image of, of a disk for, for testing or whatever else. And this may be kind of like a unique circumstance, but I know there's people here who, who teach university classes, who teach science classes, who teach classes in, in other formats. This, this has been a very valuable experience. <laughs> Um, please don't make the same mistakes I did. Whenever you plan, stick to that plan, but make sure that plan is, is viable, okay? Don't make things up that are gonna be completely unrealistic. Don't have your person traveling to another country if you're not prepared to travel to another country. If, if you start going back and messing around with data after you've already uh, generated it, people will know. People who take these classes are not stupid, okay? They're, they're smart people who probably worked in this field for a long time. If you start going in and changing things, you will leave footprints everywhere. That, you know, USB, history, log files, timestamps, whatever it is you change, people will find out and it will detract from that realism. So that's my plea to you. If you're gonna generate evidence, make sure that you, you generate the appropriate amount of evidence, whatever it is you wanna do. If you choose to go down, this down the whole image, complete image route, be prepared to invest a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of thought into how you're gonna accomplish it. And when you do that, guarantee you'll be a lot better off and your evidence, your test evidence will look absolutely spectacular. So that's all I've got. <laughs>